So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anne Davidson. I'm a rheumatologist at the Feinstein Institutes of Medical Research at Northwell Health. And I will be presenting this session together with Dr. Judith James from Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation. So today, what we'd like to do is to give you a, a primer on COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccines, specifically focused for patients with autoimmune diseases. Okay, so our goals today are to uh, first give an introduction to COVID-19 and the vaccines, and I'll be doing that. And then I'll move over to Dr. James, who'll talk about special considerations for patients with autoimmunity. And then if we have time, we're going to present a little bit about um, future research that we're involved with. So COVID cases in the United States, as I'm sure you're all aware, have come in the number of waves starting um, in early of 2020, we had a major wave over the winter of 2020. And when the vaccines became available, cases started to go down. But when the Delta variant arrived, uh, we've had another surge, which we're still somewhat in the middle of. So how does our immune system protect us from this virus? So the virus is a uh, virus from the species coronavirus, uh, and that's really based on its appearance. It's got these little nubs that stick out from it, looking a bit like a crown. And um, these are the nubs that have been used to make the vaccine, and these are the nubs that we recognize with our immune system. So our immune system can recognize the virus through two main mechanisms. The first one is shown on the left side, and that is our antibodies. So these antibodies are made by specialized white blood cells that, um, that will uh, uh, expand and make very um, highly effective antibodies that can prevent the nubs on the virus from binding to receptors on cells. And this prevents the virus from actually getting into the cell. So the infection never really gets started. And this is the basis for the monoclonal antibodies that we have available to us as well. On the right side, what I'm showing is the other arm of the immune response. And these are a different kind of lymphocyte. These lymphocytes get primed and activated when the virus enters the cell. So there you really need to have some kind of um, infection going on. And then they will become activated. They will help the cells that are making the antibodies to make better antibodies and they will produce soluble factors that will help to fight the virus. Now, one of the problems with COVID-19 is that sometimes it induces so many of these soluble factors that it makes people very ill. So how long does this immune response last if you've had an infection? Well, what we know is for all virus infections that you'll get a peak of a response over the first few weeks after the virus infection, and then things will slowly wane away. And each virus has its own particular um, uh, ability to induce an immune response and to, um, and to have one that's long lasting. So measles, for example, will give you a lifelong response, but viruses belonging to the coronavirus family tend to give a bit of a, a more short-lived response. So what you can see in purple is the virus coming up and going away. And then we can see the antibody response in the light blue that can last for weeks to months. And the uh, other lymphocytes, they are called T cells that also last for a few weeks to months. And then there's some memory so that next time the virus comes along, we make a better response. Now, coronavirus itself is one that doesn't induce a particularly robust memory. And that's why people can get coronaviruses more than once. So how do we get our immune system to work better? We have these now wonderful vaccines. So we have two types of vaccines available in the United States. The first on the left is a so-called RNA vaccine. That's where the genetic material for these uh, protein nubs on the virus are delivered to cells. The cells will make the protein and then the immune response will get tricked into thinking that the virus is there and will make the same kind of lymphocyte response that I showed you previously uh, in response to a natural infection. The other vaccine we have available, uh, and that, those vaccines are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And the other vaccine that we have available 
is one where the um, genetic material for the virus has been put inside another harmless virus. So that virus will go in and infect the cells, will release the genetic material for this protein, and the immune response will carry on the same way as I just indicated. So um, again, we have this so-called adaptive response where we have the cells that make the antibodies that stop the virus from getting into your cells. And then we have the other lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, that help to activate those uh, B cells and also to kill uh, virus-infected cells and release soluble protective factors. And then after that, you will have some memory. And uh, if you encounter the virus later, those cells will get activated much, much faster so that you don't get a severe infection. And that's what we're seeing with the vaccines right now. Okay, so do the vaccines work? Yes, they work. So this is a map of the United States. And in green, you see the share of the population that's been fully vaccinated. And in purple, you see the patients who've been admitted to the hospital. So in areas where most of the population that have, uh, have been vaccinated, very few people are being admitted to the hospitals. And in areas where very few people have been vaccinated, a lot of people are still being admitted to the hospitals. So these, these vaccines work very well to protect us against the severe disease that will end up uh, putting us in the hospital. Okay, so unfortunately, the uh, response, the immune response to both the viruses and the vaccines do go down over time. And so what I'm showing you here is very recent information that was just published showing you the antibody levels in people who were vaccinated and how they decreased. You can see the slope going down over time so that the amount of protection for, from the vaccine from being at a high, and this is real world data, this actually comes from Argentina, from being at a high of almost 80% right after the vaccine goes down uh, afterwards. And so people are still getting some infections, although they're not ending up in the hospital. And this is the reason that the boosters have been recommended. So we have some experience available to us from Israel where boosters have already been given to a large proportion of the population. So what you can see is the same kind of waxing and waning of the virus in Israel. So they started their vaccination program very early and they started it in around December of 2020. They had a very beautiful response because a lot of their population was vaccinated. Infections went down. But then infections started to go up again about eight to nine months after the initial round of uh, vaccinations for their population. So they have started giving boosters to everybody. And with the administration of the boosters, the, um, the rate of infection, particularly in the over 60 age group that got the boosters first, has really started to go down again. And so the boosters uh, do work and help to protect against infection in patients who have uh, previously received the vaccine. Uh, so in summary, for my part, um, I think you're all aware that COVID has caused more than 700,000 deaths so far in the United States. We've had a very large death rate compared to many other countries, uh, but we're now uh, fortunate um, to have the vaccines. And the vaccines work very well against all the current strains that are currently out there. Uh, and that includes the Delta variant. But the efficacy of the vaccine does wane over time, necessitating booster infection. Boosters do restore protection in the uh, healthy population, um, but there are still many, many unknowns. This is a moving target. We don't know how long the boosters are going to last for. Dr. James is going to show you all kinds of unknowns in the autoimmune situation where there are you know, complications and, and, and confounding factors and various other things that we have to take into consideration. So uh, having given you that introduction to what happens in a, a normal healthy population, I'm gonna hand over to her to talk to you about specific things that we need to be concerned about in patients with autoimmune diseases. Anne has given us a beautiful introduction to COVID and the vaccines. And now I'm going to kind of transition us and talk about autoimmune disease patients. And um, 
to kind of help us get there. I wanted to point out something that you may have heard some about is that many of the patients who are otherwise previously healthy will generate some of the things in the bloodstream that look like what we see in our autoimmune disease patients. And so Dr. Davidson and I both still see patients and many of the patients that we see have diseases like systemic lupus or Sjogren's syndrome, um, scleroderma, systemic sclerosis. And so in all of those diseases, one of the kind of shared themes is that most of those diseases have where the, your body starts attacking your cells and you make these abnormal proteins that are called autoantibodies. And those autoantibodies bind to some protein that is present in cells of everybody, of all humans. And so many of those are um, targets like anti-Joe, anti-Ro, um, all of these different names. And many of you probably know what kind of autoantibody you have running around in your bloodstream. And so in patients who have had COVID, who previously did not know or did not have an autoimmune disease, um, we're seeing the presence of these autoantibodies. And so this, you're, you're gonna get your medical school 101 here, okay? So we have 147 different hospitalized patients. Each row is a different um, sample from a different person, right? And each column is a different protein target. And so down here, you can see patients who have kind of what we think of these classic autoimmune diseases. And so the red dots are positive, meaning that they have antibodies that bind to those self proteins. And in most of our healthy individuals, you can see that there's no, um, not a significant amount of binding. And so the bindings in red and no bindings in black. But all of these individuals up here are people who have been hospitalized with COVID-19. And so you can see that there are a few people who have antibodies that look like scleroderma and some that look like um, inflammatory muscle disease or myositis, um, lupus and other diseases. And then many of these individuals make antibodies against some of those soluble factors that Dr. Davidson was talking about that are increased in COVID patients and they can make antibodies against those responses. So over half of patients who are really sick with COVID, sick enough to be hospitalized, will make at least one of these autoantibodies. And for most of these individuals, they're able to make those autoantibodies go away over time. And so uh, another group from New York has basically looked at patients who have lupus compared to patients who have COVID-19, compared to healthy other individuals. Um, and they found that lupus patients have higher levels of these antibodies and that many patients with COVID-19 have similar levels that we see in lupus patients for multiple different kinds of protein targets. And then if we look at how severe the disease is, the patients who have um, become the, the most ill with COVID-19 are more likely to make these abnormal responses. And so the other thing I wanted to point out, and many of you may know, because some of you probably have, have uh, recovered from COVID, is that some of the symptoms that are common in patients with COVID-19 overlap with some of the driving symptoms that we see in our patients with autoimmune diseases. And so for example, joint pain. So almost half of patients who have COVID-19, whenever they're acutely ill, will basically have joints that are really sore, some of them even swollen. And that we're also seeing this in a significant percentage, about a quarter of a patients that have long symptoms of COVID or long COVID or post-acute sequelae of COVID. Um, and so this is kind of in the post more than 28 days after they had their acute infection. And um, we also see almost all patients have severe fatigue whenever they have acute COVID and that almost half of individuals who have long COVID will continue to have severe fatigue. And even things that are more specific for some of our autoimmune diseases like Sika syndrome, which means dry eyes and dry mouth and is very, very common in Sjogren's patients is also present in a significant subset of people who have long symptoms after their COVID-19. We're also seeing a number of different autoimmune diseases that could possibly be triggered by this acute, very aggressive viral illness. And so some of these you may have heard about like Guillain-Barre or Mycenae gravis. Others are really, these are still pretty rare, but we're seeing more and more autoimmune diseases that seem like they may occur after um, COVID-19, probably in people who were genetically predisposed to develop an autoimmune disease.
And so what does this mean for patients who have autoimmune diseases? And even though Dr. Davidson and I both work mainly in lupus, we are trying to make this a little more broad to the different diseases that are of interest and to the people on today's webinar. And so how do patients with autoimmune disease respond to COVID-19? Is it much, much worse in our patients? And so um, there have been multiple studies that have come out. I'm just gonna highlight a few. So in lupus patients, you're more likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19, especially in the early phases of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in a paper that came out from New York University, they found that lupus patients who were Latina, uh, that had increased BMI, had a history of kidney involvement with their lupus, or had the other kind of what we call comorbidities or the other chronic medical conditions that have been associated with COVID-19 were enriched in those lupus patients who were more likely to be hospitalized as well. In rheumatoid arthritis patients, if you control for all those other factors that we know increase your risk of having severe COVID, like increased BMI, heart disease, um, other things like that, um, and they match them based upon age and race and gender, um, that we really didn't see a big difference between rheumatoid arthritis patients and these matched other individuals um, for hospitalization rates. And it may be because patients who are on certain kinds of medications um, that modify a part of their immune system, like the TNF inhibitors, may actually have a little lower risk of being hospitalized compared to patients who are on other medicines that may increase your risk of being hospitalized, like being on higher doses of prednisone uh, before you contract COVID-19. Um, in MS patients, we've also seen an increased risk of hospitalization, mainly in patients who are on a B-cell depleting therapy or anti-CD20 therapy. Again, they have more pneumonia, more pulmonary or lung involvement, and again, associated with the same kind of factors, risk factors that are seen in the general population. And the same thing with inflammatory bowel disease, slightly high, higher risk of hospitalization with COVID. And again, associated with increased age, uh, comorbidities and steroid use. And so I thought this was kind of an interesting thing to bring up to this group. And so of course, as the COVID-19 pandemic was kind of rolling across the world, um, different groups were trying to get together and say, how can we understand how this is affecting our patients? And so uh, there was a COVID-19 Global Rheumatology Alliance that was formed. And this included rheumatologists, but also patients who were very interested in sharing their experience so that they could help to inform what we was working or wasn't working in uh, our autoimmune disease patients. And so um, this was driven by the patients and providers Patients completed detailed questionnaires and, and patient reported outcomes. This is the website down here. And uh, providers put in information from patients that gave consent. They rapidly generated a lot of data for more than 9,000 autoimmune disease rheumatic patients from 40 different countries. And they published a number of different papers and helped us identify what predicts hospitalization. Again, finding this higher dose of prednisone, age over 65 and comorbidities. And so I think one of the most interesting things to come out of this kind of uh, alliance that formed around interested patients and interested clinicians uh, was that the kind of lessons that we've learned in putting this worldwide group together actually changed the way we think about doing research that will help our autoimmune disease patients. So just very quickly, I was gonna show you a little bit of data from our autoimmune disease patient cohort in Oklahoma who've been infected. And we enrolled individuals who had any kind of autoimmune disease, um, multiple different types of, of, of patients enrolled, including people with different kinds of racial and ethnic backgrounds. Uh, because we're a lupus center, we saw more patients with lupus, but also rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune thyroid disease, and a little bit of uh, other autoimmune illnesses. And what we found compared to other COVID-19 um, patients who didn't have an autoimmune disease, that the severity scale and the severity ratings that we saw were very similar. You know, the frequency of severe or moderate disease were very similar between our patients and other patients. And that the symptoms that we saw um, were similar, but there may be more dizziness, more um, GI complaints, more shortness of breath, uh, more body aches and joint pain and fatigue 
in patients who have an underlying autoimmune disease who then contract COVID-19. And I think one of the most striking things we found is that we're following these patients over time and they're giving us information about how they're doing recovering from COVID and how what their long-term symptoms are. And that um, we had about half of our participants who were still having symptoms more than 28 days after they um, tested positive for COVID-19. And then if we compare that to our other individuals who did not have an autoimmune disease, that it was only about 18%. So our autoimmune disease patients who do get COVID may have symptoms that last significantly longer than the general population. And so these are people that um, were involved in this and we've been fortunate to have some funding from the NIH. But I guess the question I thought might be the most important to this group is what can autoimmune disease patients do? And so one of the things I would encourage you to do is to stay in touch with your autoimmune disease clinicians. Um, for many of that, those will be your rheumatologist or dermatologist or primary care, whoever is your main physician who takes care of your autoimmune disease. Because as Dr. Davidson said, things are changing, it feels like on a daily basis, uh, but definitely at least on a weekly basis of what kind of advice we can give our patients. Remember that you are at higher risk of hospitalization, severe disease, that you have to continue, even though none of us wanna hear this anymore, thinking about social distancing, masking, and avoiding high risk transmission activities and locations. And then of course, if you become ill, uh, you uh, really need to get tested because early identification can allow you to be treated with the monoclonal antibodies that Dr. Davidson mentioned, and there's other outpatient therapies now, and we may have you hold some of your autoimmune disease medications so that you can better fight off the COVID infection. And then of course, vaccination. Vaccination, not just for you, but also for your family members, your close contacts, other people that you're around all the time. Because we know vaccination in autoimmune disease patients, in the vast majority of patients, um, respond just as well as people in the general population. And so here are healthy individuals, and these are uh, two weeks after they get their second shot. You can see that 96% of people are making a really robust response, except for this one poor person in the healthy group. These are immune-mediated diseases, and so these are mainly autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, a little bit of lupus. You can see that most of these patients are doing really well. So 92% look just like the healthy individuals, um, but about 72% of patients who are taking a certain medication and that certain medication was methotrexate. And so there are several different reports now that suggest that methotrexate, mycophenolate, B cell depleting agents, um, may be associated with not making quite as good of a response. But again, this kind of summarizes a lot of the different studies that have come out about COVID vaccination in autoimmune disease patients. And you can see that out of 100% response that the vast majority of autoimmune disease patients are somewhere over here in about 85% of patients looking like they make a good response. Um, but the outliers over here are patients who are taking B cell depleting um, agents. And those are like anti-CD20, rituximab, ocrelizumab for multiple sclerosis and others. Um, but the thing to remember is even though the antibodies may not look good, that some of these patients may actually be able to have other parts of their immune system, like their T cells, that may respond to the vaccine and may be able to provide some aspect of, of protection. And so there are certain medications that may decrease your ability to make a really good response to the vaccine, like B cell depleting therapies, mycophenolate, methotrexate, maybe others like JAK inhibitors or other multiple sclerosis medications, um, Abatacept, for example. Um, but we feel that it's really important that we have additional research so we'll know who are the people who are not responding, why are they not able to make a response, how can we help those individuals potentially make a response to the vaccine? Who are the autoimmune disease patients that are having breakthrough infections, meaning you've been vaccinated, but then end up with COVID-19 and especially severe breakthrough infections. So infections that end people up in the hospital or in the ICU. And um, as I mentioned, even if you have low antibodies after you have a vaccine, um, are there other parts of your immune system that are poised and ready to respond uh, in case you have been exposed or when you are exposed? 
to COVID-19? And then are there things we can do like holding medications, taking booster vaccinations at certain time points, or are there other vaccine types that might be better for our patients? So research is needed to address um, those kinds of questions and help us to find answers. And so Dr. Davidson and I are both involved in some large projects trying to understand whether or not COVID booster vaccinations really um, help our autoimmune disease patients and how can we optimize the responses that autoimmune disease patients have to these vaccines. And so uh, in collaboration with investigators from uh, the Feinstein Institute as well in New York, as well as Michigan and Pennsylvania, um, we're leading a study through the Autoimmunity Centers of Excellence um, that are looking at COVID both booster vaccination and autoimmune disease patients who have low antibodies after they get their regular primary series of vaccinations. So for Pfizer and Moderna, you get your two shots and then we check your antibodies. And if your antibodies are low and you're on certain medications, then you would qualify for the study. And so the diseases that we're studying to begin with are lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic sclerosis or scleroderma is this other name, uh, multiple sclerosis and pemphigus. And you have to be on one of the medications that have been associated with a poor response. So mycophenolate um, or myfortic or um, methotrexate is another medication or B cell depleting therapy. We're studying all of the vaccines that are currently available. And we are testing whether or not holding your medicines around the time of vaccination actually improve the response to the vaccination compared to um, individuals who come in and just keep taking their medicine like usual. And this is also um, closely monitoring patients for any increases in disease activity, any kind of increased adverse events, of which so far things are looking good. And then it also has an adaptive design, which means that uh, you've heard try, try again. Uh, this is a clinical trial that actually lets us try, try again. And so if we find that there's a subset of autoimmune disease patients who are not doing well with the booster, that we'll be able to do an adaptive design to allow them to have something else to see if there's some other vaccination. Can we switch to a different vaccine? Can we do something else like give monoclonal antibodies to decrease um, the infection in our patients? There are now sites active all across the United States. I put in the phone number and the, the contact for a person here in case you're trying to find these, or you can go to clinicaltrials.gov, and this is the number that you can look up and it'll tell you all the sites and the contact for the place um, of the country that may be closest to you. And then finally, um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Davidson to talk about another large, exciting study that's going on. Okay, thank you, Judith. Um, so uh, just to continue in the vein of research, uh, we really need to find out more about our patients, our patients with autoimmune diseases, how they respond to the vaccine and how they respond to the booster. The study that, um, that Dr. James just told you about is for people who didn't make a very good antibody response to their first set of vaccinations. But what we're interested in understanding is uh, what happens to people who made an okay response. And so the questions we're asking there are, well, is their response really okay? Does it go down faster? Uh, is it really protective? Um, what happens if they get a booster? And so on. And so what we're doing is a real world study. It's an observational study, uh, again, in collaboration with our autoimmunity centers of excellence, in which we're studying more than 500 patients with diverse autoimmune diseases on lots of different medications. And we're following them for one year and looking at intervals to see how well the immune response is, is holding up in our autoimmune patients who are on lots of different medications, how it's holding up over time. And so we are uh, measuring, so this because it's a real world study and we're not controlling everything, we're using a lot of self-reported data. So are our patients having side effects? Are they having flare-ups of their disease? And then we're measuring the antibody responses. We're measuring how good the antibody response is, how high the antibody response goes, and whether that antibody response can actually stop the virus from getting into cells. And then we're looking at the other kinds of responses. 
So we have some very sophisticated technologies available to us to look to see what the other arm of the immune response is doing. So um, we know actually from one of our investigators that the patients on B-cell depleting agents make really terrible antibody responses, but their T lymphocyte responses are actually enhanced. And what that means in terms of protection, we still don't understand, but it's something that we need to, to study more. Um, so this will help us uh, follow those patients. So we're going to be looking at all different medications to see what happens to the T cell responses. And we will be looking at memory responses as well to see how well patients are going to um, react to a second uh, intrusion or an intrusion by the real virus should that come along. So this study has had to be uh, adaptive because when we first started it, the boosters were not available and now they are. So we've adapted it to include those. So, um, so here are the questions we're asking. So how well do our patients in the general community with autoimmune diseases respond to our vaccines and boosters? And how long does this response last? And how do the various medications affect the antibody responses and the T cell responses? And out of this, together with the study that Dr. James is doing on those patients who didn't mount a good response to the vaccine in the first place, we hope to be able to contribute to determining what the best practices are for patients with autoimmune diseases. And so each patient with autoimmune disease is an individual with a different disease and a different set of medications who received probably one of three different vaccines. So for each patient, it's going to be, well, what's best in my situation? And so we're hoping to contribute to an understanding of what might be best for the individual although we can't always be 100% certain. And because the goalposts are moving so rapidly, we're doing the best uh, predictions and the best recommendations that we can on any uh, particular week and hoping that that will hold up to scrutiny the week after that. Um, and so discuss with your doctors um, the best way to handle things. The literature comes out very frequently. There's lots of places um, to get information um, in reputable uh, online sites. And um, we hope that we'll be able to release this information as soon as we have it. We would just like to thank everyone who um, tuned in and listened to this. We're sorry that we're unable to take questions in real time. I think technology has come a long way during the pandemic. Um, but there are still challenges in your app. I think there are places that you can uh, bring up questions that you feel like we weren't able to address today or other things that you think might be good topics for uh, future webinars. And we would just like to thank everyone for their um, attendance today and um, tuning in. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. Okay, thank you. And goodbye to everybody and have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>